on digital and social media marketing. So please welcome Shannon. All right, everyone. Um, so I created this presentation um, in mind that we hear more and more that there are smaller teams being asked to do a lot more, especially with technology advancing um, and also with smaller budgets to get all of these things done. So uh, in my experience, I um, have about just uh, three years with social media advertising, both in-house with an agency, um, and my teams have always been extremely small, whether it be just me or I worked um, with myself and a blogger, myself and a community manager, maybe just a graphic designer, and we kind of have to wear all hats to get things done. So I just kind of want to read the room and see like who's on a team of like one to three. Like five to seven? Anyone? Okay. And 10 or more? All right, you guys are lucky. <laughs> All right, so, and I mean this in the nicest way possible as I move forward, but the real problem isn't that we have, you know, one, two, three people working on our team. It's that we're energized, we are inspired and we're empowered to do these things. Like we're seeing a lot of case studies and a lot of examples of these, you know, big name agencies or companies that are doing great things and keeping up with, you know, the emerging technologies. I think what tends to happen is we get in our own way. We start to think that, oh my gosh, they've got to have like 50 people doing this. I can't even possibly do it. So I'm not even going to bother. But that's not the case. There's a way that we can work around that to actually get things done. So our solution, and as I move forward, I am going to um, primarily talk about organic uh, social media and kind of getting um, what a colleague of mine calls your heartbeat of promotions, something that's always on and going to keep your audience engaged. Our solution is to define your truth, determine your existing resources, and design a systematic approach. We are small, but we are mighty, and we can get it done. Um, I like to quote Leslie Nope a lot. I don't know if you guys watch Parks and Rec, but always, you know, channel your inner Leslie Nope and how she's always um, talking to Anne and giving her these really uh, interesting compliments. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what I do, and then um, talk about how you can think about it for what you do um, in your companies, because. Um, with working in higher education, I think it's a little, the terminology and the things that we do are a little specific, but just think about it in a broader sense. So um, the Office of Graduate Admissions and Recruitment, also known as OGAR, is uh, decentralized admissions. So with the about 225 graduate programs here, each program sets their own admission standards. They have their own little marketing teams, like they're doing a lot of stuff on their own, and we're here um, to help in a centralized way. So uh, and my team specifically working directly on um, the marketing is myself and uh, my graduate assistant. And then we will lean on our other team members at times. And we have a team of six, I think, seven. Thank you. My boss is in the room. <laughs> so um, to think about this in a more broader sense, it's your company and your department. It's competing priorities. And it's your team members and their strengths. So defining your truth. This is your purpose. It's not your goal, but it closely aligns with it because it's going to help you get to your goal. It's your obligation to your audiences. So for um, the Office of Graduate Admissions, we are a service unit, and we assist with the marketing um, of the WVU graduate programs um, communication with interested and applied students, and then processing all of graduate level applications. So this tells us our goal is obviously to increase applications. Increased applications ideally means increased butts and in seats. And our truth then is to provide a simple explanation of what the process to apply is and promoting the programs because that's of the most interest to the student. They're not going to come here if there's not a program 
a research, a faculty, you know, um, a service that doesn't align with what they want. So we help in sharing that um, information. And this is what's going to guide us forward. So determining our existing resources. We're not going to reinvent the wheel. We're going to remember our truth. And we're going to break this down um, so it's a little bit easier to process into two main groups, our um, admissions process and then uh, program promotion. So our content group one is our graduate admissions process. And this is what we're going to call original content. So this is going to come, any content is going to come from your website. It's going to come from frequently asked questions. And in a broader sense, your company or your department website and uh, frequently asked questions could come from customer service. Phone calls that you're getting, emails that you're getting, um, comments, direct messages for social media. We have a graduate admissions vanity email account that um, over the last couple of months I've seen a trend of the same questions being asked. So it came to my attention that we need to do better to answer those questions for the students. This is the only thing you're going to potentially reinvent the wheel. The only thing you're going to take the time to make for yourself, because this is your own content. So how do we do this? Or right, here's examples of, I'm sorry, of um, what we make. A graphic, like this is uh, deadlines that are coming up. Um, another example is, you know, we own um, what kind of transcripts people need to send, uh, that they need to pay their um, application fee, that they're doing their application, if they're international, what they need to submit at the university level. Then aside from that, all the other requirements are on the programs. So this is what we own, and this is what we drive, and this is what um, is original to us. And I'm not a graphic designer but I did create these, and I used a system called uh, Canva online. I'm not sure if anyone has heard of this, but it is awesome because with not coming from that background, you're able to still make um, pleasing graphics. This is just an example of all of the templates that they have in there, and it stems from social media to blogs um, to LinkedIn, ads and sizes for original content, or I'm sorry, uh, organic content newsletters, a couple other things, um, thank you notes. So here's just a quick video. Of what this process looks like. So you go in, you kind of decide what it is you're going to make first. And one of the also um, cool things about it is people can make their uh, designs public, so you can go in and choose any template that's there and make it your own, um, which also helps me a lot with deciding, you know, just kind of creatively, like, I know I want to do this, but how do I want to make it look? So I kind of view some of the templates that are there, and then you can change it to do what you're trying to do and make it on brand and add your own images, um, things like that. And the more you do it, the faster it gets, because now I'm finding that I've made one. I like that. I'm going to keep plugging away with it so that this isn't taking you know, a lot of time out of your day to do it. One of the, the features, too, when I dragged and dropped the um, photo in is it automatically sizes it as well. So you don't have to worry about anything looking pixelated. And then you save it, download it, and you're ready to go. So for Canva, there is a free and a premium option. Um, the premium option you do pay for, but it is extremely cheap less than $200, and I found that the sources that are available, once you do pay for that, if you're able to, are even better than what the free options have. 
Um, they've got the correct sizes, hundreds of templates. In the paid version, you can automatically save in your brand colors, your brand fonts, um, logos, anything that aligns, and those will be the default settings for you. And then you can organize and upload um, your pictures into folders so you can quickly go per department, um, per whatever goal it is you're trying to make. So it's really, again, makes it just faster and simpler to get um, these things done. So my favorite feature is the um, automatic uh, simple resize, which they call like their magic abracadabra. I'm sorry, I had a video, but I can't find the mouse for it. <laughs> so anyway, what that feature um, shows is if you create like say an Instagram image first, there's a um, button up in the top and you you go to the drop down menu and you click any other sizes that you want and it automatically opens them into say like your Insta, um, your Facebook size, your Twitter size, your LinkedIn size and then all you have to do is expand the backgrounds and move the text or um, the image so that it's centered or however you want it. But the video itself, um, I had the image already made and the resizing only took 32 seconds. So it really does help in streamlining the process. So for um, determining your existing resources, this will be for our second content group, um, the graduate program promotion. And this is what we're gonna call our curated content. It's not something that's original to us, someone else owns it, and by um, using what they have already created, we're eliminating duplicating content, um, which if it's something that they already have and then you're creating it, it's constantly going back to them, making sure if they updated something, you updated something, and, how often does that happen that you're notified when something is changed and then you might have outdated information. So it's letting that person or that department own what's true to them and you just utilize it. So we rely on, or I rely on our department um, programs and websites, um, particularly their news and events section, program press releases, and then program social media platforms. And you can think, um, broadly of internal department web pages, intranets or newsletters. And we have a daily uh, newsletter that goes out that I also um, look for content there. And any external partners. Um, I used to work for a company that we were a manufacturer and we had agencies across the nation that helped sell our products. And if they were sharing something, you know, a promotion in their area, then we would share that. Just in case the audience comes to the manufacturer first versus coming to that area. Same thing for graduate admission. Sometimes we might catch a student coming directly to us or they found, you know, say the business college and that's where they're captured. So it helps then um, promote across all of the platforms that are related uh, to your company. So for curated content, we all know that there's a lot out there. And you know, for 225 graduate programs, how am I to determine what is the most important to them? So what I do on a weekly basis is send out a call for content. It kind of looks like this. It's a form, online form, that asks uh, programs to submit what's going on in their school or even with a specific program, if there's any research, awards, like new faculty, students are going on a trip, students want awards, or they're um, going to conferences so people can connect, and it lets them decide you know, what's important, and then I can share that on their behalf. So it's a weekly reminder, simple online form, and like I said, they get to decide what is most important. So we use Wufu um, by SurveyMonkey, and again, this is uh, free or a very low cost options to um, produce this and put in your own branding. The link to the form is live, you know, 24 seven, unless for any reason I were to go in and turn it off. So even though I only send it out weekly, um, I encourage the programs to save it in their um, browser so that they can go to it any time. I ask that they consider us a media, same as they would send it to the newsletter or same as they would send it to um, the newspaper or whoever to kind of get their um, uh, program or whatever news shared. I ask that they consider this as well. The responses are sent directly to my email, which helps for documentation purposes, and then I can go in and see what's being sent, when it was sent, and then um, my GA helps me schedule them so we have a process of uh, how that happens. 
So for content groups one and two, there's a third type of content called user-generated content that can be used and is extremely helpful. Um, we reach out and look at potential students, current students, alumni, or faculty. And this can be like your customers, your employees, or your, le your leadership, and again, external partners. And there are quite a different ways to get this, and I have um, examples of a few ways that we do it. But this user-generated content is super important because it's real, it's authentic, and it's showing like your customer using your product or how happy they are with it, um, how your employees are at work, like if you know you have a unique um, work environment or something like that that you want to showcase, maybe for recruitment or even just to show a little bit of your personality that you're not just there, you know, to sell this product. And then um, again, external partners if there's promotions or they're out at events or anything like that that's even happening in real time that you can then share on their behalf. So the first thing we do, and um, as he's stating, we do want to use hashtags, but we don't want to use them frivolously. So our hashtag search, we look for branded hashtags, like WVU uh, grad school, WVU MBA, anything like that. Generic hashtags, just like grad school, MBA. And then related ones, Morgantown, Country Roads, WVU. Because these are all going to be on students or anyone who has a relationship with the university that can be used. So here's just um, a couple examples. I did a search um, to see, uh, you know, like someone graduating, they just started their program, they're doing an international trip, and that was um, a local like printmaking thing with students um, down on High Street. So all of these can be shared to show that, you know, we're, there's more to experience than just your academics. So the one way we do this is through account list on Twitter, and this has been extremely beneficial. We uh, went in and made lists for um, internal departments, um, and I'm working on one for alumni, students, faculty is a little bit easier because we know who they are, um, and then competitors. So it's really easy to go in on your Twitter, and um, there's an uh, area for lists under the menu, and you just start adding the um, programs to it. So then what I do is this list will show up similar to your newsfeed, but it only shows the um, accounts that you want to see. So you can quickly go in and scroll through and see, oh, that's cool, I want to like retweet that. Oh, that's cool, I'm going to schedule this. If you, um, on my next slide, I'll talk about TweetDeck, and if you use that, you can also schedule your retweets for advanced, which um, specifically on Twitter, it's important to be kind of going 24-7 because the um, cycle changes really quickly. So TweetDeck is a free platform. As long as you have Twitter, you just log in, go to you know, tweetdeck.com, and whatever profile you're logged into, it will automatically load it in for you. And this is just an example of what it looks like when you log in. You have um, kind of like your home area, which is like your news feed, um, the activity, which is what your followers are doing. And then that's also beneficial, too, because your followers might be following or engaging with someone that you haven't yet, but they have information that you can also utilize. And then, excuse me, you're uh, scheduled. So this is um, what you have coming up so you can see what um, the future is going to look like. And this is important, too, for like when you're um, getting those calls for contents in or there's something important coming up. So you can see what you have and if it's something that can wait to the future, if you need to move something out, but just so you're always on. The next one is um, kind of uh, combining that hashtag search. You can actually create columns for the various hashtags that you want, and it will pull in, even people you don't follow, it will pull in all of their information, and then you can quickly scroll through, and you can um, find the information. Um, and so I added a few there that we kind of monitor. And then competitors. So we have a few here, like the Big 12 schools, um, your regional competitors. We have the, each, a column for the colleges, um, for the programs specifically. Um, ideally, we'll have one for faculty and for students, so we're working on that. And this is really important to see what they're doing, to see if you size up, if there's something you want to try, something you need to do differently, something that you're already doing that they're not doing, so you can you know, tell that to your leadership. Um, so that has been really valuable as well. Okay, that was a lot to take in, so before we move forward, we're going to uh, recap. 
So for us specifically, our audience is our potential graduate students. And our truth is that we're gonna talk about the admissions process and promoting the programs. And our resources, website, customer service, you know, company intranets, newsletters, department websites, um, and social media platforms. And then our customers, employees, partners, again, on social media platforms. And that aligns with your original content that you own, that you will take the time to create. Your curated content that you go out and look for that's owned by someone else in your um, you know, company, by their department. And then user generated that shares that authenticity, that engagement, um, you know, that kind of real time. So we'll always remember, it's who you're talking to, what you're telling them, where you're getting the information, and how you're telling them. So you know what to designate your time to. And the more like we've gotten into this process, it's just helped quickly to say, OK, it has to align with these things. And if it doesn't, we're not going to talk about it. So a reminder before we get into the systematic process for how we're going to be posting regularly, we're going to keep our funnel in mind. Awareness and consideration content is uh, best suited for your organic social media. Social media is where people go to find you know, community. So they want to see what other people are saying. They want to ask questions. Um, they want to determine if your brand is invested. Are you out there answering those questions? Are you taking everything to a direct message and not even like acknowledging it? Or Because people want to see that you're doing something, that you're investing back into the customers. And then they're there to learn more, because they likely are in the, um, like I said, the awareness and consideration, so they want to know more before making any sort of decision. So we need to find a healthy balance of that education and the conversion-based content, because I don't know about you, but I hate when you scroll through a feed or you keep seeing updates that are like, buy this, buy this, buy this, don't buy that, buy this, because that doesn't help anyone. So our systematic approach. I use what's called a four-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one method. Um, not quite the 411. <laughs> For every four pieces of content that we share, there's going to be one soft sell and one hard sell. And the important part of this is that the majority of what you're sharing is going to be education-based. And that, for the customer, they're going to see like, oh, they were the one that told me where to go to get that you know, GRE resource. Or they were the one that told me that it's really important to make a connection with your graduate program coordinator um, you know, before you apply. And because even though it's general and it doesn't talk about your company or your brand, um, it is branded. So then they remember, oh, that was WVU. Let me see what they've got going on. Because they didn't like, you know, push it down my throat to come to school here. So this is, again, awareness and consideration phase content. Um, examples of a soft sell would be like download a guide, fill out our form for more information, something that doesn't bind them to a decision. And then the hard sell, for us, an example would be submit an application. Um, it could be make a purchase, something along those lines. Visit campus is another one. So here's what the concept kind of looks like. We do two pieces of awareness and two pieces of consideration and filter in the soft cell and the hard cell. And this has become a repetitive process. So we know what um, areas or what topics align with awareness. This could be like from your blog. Um, this can be a news uh, press release. And then consideration might be more like service that's on campus that can help them, um, what they would really need uh, to submit with their application. Um, and then soft sell in between, see if they're interested, want to find out more, they're going to contact someone, or maybe subscribe to the blog so that they get more information on a regular basis. And then hard sell, uh, we usually do like come to campus, feel what it's like to be a mountaineer, or actually begin your application. How do we manage all of this with our content calendar? And this is just in Excel. It's nothing fancy, but it gets the job done. Um, Go the first line by date, then the uh, tag we do by um, topic. So we know that this is the first day of the cycle. 
It'll be awareness, awareness, soft sell, consideration, consideration, hard sell. So I have preloaded a drop down menu that has all of the topics that relate to those. And I'll just go in and kind of click it to plan. And then my uh, graduate assistant helps with writing copy and creating images. Um, and then we you know, add tags to make sure we're tagging the appropriate people, um, hashtags that are related, what type of content it is so we know, OK, we actually don't need to create an image or a blog for this because it exists somewhere else. Or it is original, so we need to take the time to create something if we don't have it already. Um, what has been really beneficial, too, is in this uh, image link one, if we have already created something, I link it to a different folder in the Google Drive so we can just quickly download. You know, maybe you have like five um, images for the same thing that's preset, so you can recycle them and it, you're not hitting the people with the same images. But that again makes the process a lot faster if you already have it. And every week, you know, or every day, you're not going to take the time to create something new. Content calendars are important for future content planning. Um, we're already almost done with August. So that helps us get into the future. And the more you do that, then the more time you have to spend on other things up front. Because you can take a little bit of time to just plan it all out, and then you have more time for other things. Um, collaboration across departments. This is important. Um, if you were to use the Google Drive or something like that at your companies, and you have competing um, priorities or departments working together, you might offer the um, that they also uh, collaborate with you. Because you can see, especially in the Google Drive, who's doing what. So if you say in the, um, the topic uh, drop down, you want something from the customer service department, and then you have a customer service representative that can access that, and they go in and type it in themselves. That could even save you a little bit more time. And then you just review it to make sure that it is on brand, and it aligns with your uh, purpose and your goals. So we can also then review the copy and graphics before scheduling. Um, what I have found is it gets really difficult if you schedule it and then you want to make a change. Because on certain platforms like Twitter, you actually have to delete the whole thing and then go back. And that's a time chunk that you could have been doing something else. So it's really helpful to review it and then plug away you know, on the platform. And also for documentation and data collection, so this will show us historically you know, what kind of language we've used, what images we've used. And then um, at the end of the month, uh, we will add in uh, kind of like engagements or shares, anything like that. Um, we also use uh, Google custom URLs. So then that will tell us like per channel and even per um, image that we use or whatever we're testing, it will show us exactly what um, happened when we posted that, if anybody clicked, if they didn't, should we try it again? Do we need something new? So that kind of ties into uh, your A-B testing. It's all right there. It's all in the same document. And you can quickly um, get to it and review. So I have um, an example of um, our approach, the execution. So um, for awareness. The call for content submission is one of those topics. So we're sharing a press release on behalf of the bi biology department. Um, then our blog post, posting something that's educational, that might, um, you know, someone who's like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm interested, but how do I pay for it? But they don't really like, you know, want to know too much yet. So they can get a really brief description of, um, you know, graduate assistantships. Then we have um, our soft sell. So we're asking them to fill out an inquiry form so that they can get connected with a program coordinator and they can start that conversation. Um, this is particularly imp important for us because I can't make those recommendations on behalf of the programs. So if you know you don't want to talk on behalf of a department, you want to make sure that there's channels so that um, the customers can get filtered to the person that's going to help them the most. For consideration, then we talk about um, an upcoming deadline. Make sure that, um, and that links to then a website that shows all the admissions um, uh, requirements that they need when they submit. And then a program fact. Um, so this one um, ironically aligns with graduate assistantships again. But that students uh, who are in this program, most of them are offered funding. But So we, we will switch this around um, and say how, you know, IMC and DMC hold their Integrate Conference every year. So that's a way for online students to engage you know, with current students, alumni, those types of things, um, just 
kind of random facts. And I went through all you know, websites for um, colleges and departments to find these things. So it's really easy to get. And then finally, our hard sell. Um, you know, don't take our word for it. Come here. Now that you've gotten some more information, you're feeling like you're ready to apply, maybe you should you know, step on campus and see what it feels like if it's the right fit for you. Because we don't really want anyone you know, to apply blind and come here, and then they're not happy, and then we lose a student. So it's helpful to get that beforehand. So linearly, this is what it looks like. Follow that process. And then awareness, you know, call for content, something like that starts again on Monday. And it just keeps going. And the more you can get into that cycle, it goes faster and faster, and you have more time to dedicate to other things. And that's all I have. <laughs> If we have um, any questions, Amber's going to take a mic around. Oh, yeah, go right ahead. Okay. <laughs> All right, so anybody have any questions? Good afternoon, Shannon. Um, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Um, just, I'm just curious about it. So I'm, I work for a decentralized organization as well mm -hmm. um, that has many other um, um, different departments that have their own communications and marketing teams. I'm just curious about your thoughts. Sometimes um, as you're curating content for different departments, some departments may have co um, content more frequently than others, mm -hmm. or some content is maybe stronger than other, um, other, other departments' content. What, is, what do you all do to kind of make sure there's some balance across, sure. uh, across um, all the different departments and you have the essential, uh, pretty much a, a message that supports e each other? Yeah, so um, for the call for content, I primarily rely on those that submit, and if they're submitting it, it's gonna go out but we balance it on the other side with consideration. So we'll do um, a cycle for the program so that we get you know, a page of all the admissions requirements for each program, um, you know, kind of just regularly, and again with the program facts. So more on the consideration side is where we balance that out, but I let um, the program submit their you know, press releases or their news. Hmm? Hi. Um you had mostly positive content. How do you deal with negative tweets of, I wasn't admitted, it took forever, those kind of things? Um, we actually had this happen recently with an international student, and um, there was a lot of just comments on pictures. So, you know, we just reply and we say, I said, um, you know, th thank you for your interest, and we'd like to talk more about what happened, how we can make it different for, you know, other students that are coming. Um, thankfully, I was already aware of the situation beforehand, but that doesn't always happen. Um, we did have a funny thing where I was doing ads, and someone who had decided to go to another school was getting targeted, and he was like, why am I getting these messages? Ha, ha, ha. Like, this looks bad. And I was like, oh, no. So that was more of an internal, and I said, you know, I'm sorry. Um, that uh, that happened. We we were using a database that wasn't clean, you know, something like that. So, but we don't actually. I haven't um, dealt with too many negative. It's been overall positive, or just a lot of questions. But then we just answer um, when we get them. Hi, very, very good presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, how do you track what data, what metrics do you use to gauge success or, or, or the lack of success? And also, do you use, you've mentioned quite a few different marketing technologies. For example, do you use any kind of like Basecamp or Rike or any, any other type of scheduling to track how things are moving along and if they're being accomplished? Sure. Um, we were recently using um, a platform, Sprout Social, to kind of bring everything together, but I'm, um, I've decided to back off of that due to the Facebook privacy issues. You're not, there's some things that we were trying to do that you're no longer able to do in those platforms. So we've kind of backtracked and just used the native data in all of the platforms, uh, primarily Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and collect that in the call for content Excel. I'm primarily looking at engagements like, uh, like shares comments, just for the vanity of it to see if it's working. Um, comments specifically, if they're asking questions, then questions can um, field what we content we need if we're not answering it um, enough or if we're not answering it detailed enough. Um, the biggest driver is if they're actually committing or doing the action. 
So as far as the, um, that, the, the vanity like likes, um, shares, comments would be more for information that we're sharing that gets sent to other websites that I can't track directly. But then the ones that I can track will use the Google URLs, the custom URLs. So then you could track channels and um, the topics and even the um, image if you're doing testing or whatever it is you want to test. And we look at those to see what the um, volume is and then when they're on the website, what they're doing from there. Hi, um, a couple of questions. Um, for Canva, what are you using those graphics um, specifically for? Those just like the, um, the header image for like your Facebook content and things like that. And also when you're posting this content, is it um, organic content on the pages or are these uh, paid um, sponsored posts? Sure. Um, so for Canva, I actually use that for pretty much anything I'm creating a graphic for, primarily anything that's going to go on social media, um, in our uh, automated email communication plans for headers. Um, I don't think there's a little bit, I think, on our website as far as getting just um, links to size, like if we have a link to uh, Instagram so it doesn't look pixelated. That's what I uh, primarily use it for. And what I showed today was organic, but I do use that as well to create content for ads and we do uh, run ads as well. Hi, I'm Stacy. Um, I work in a private school and I'm the director of public relations there. So basically everything you've talked about has been awesome uh, for me professionally. But my question is, how do you decide between what's going to be um, on Twitter versus Facebook versus Instagram, how do you make those content decisions as to which uh, platform is best for which content? So right now we're actually, I need to do some more testing with that. Um, since uh, it's just myself and my graduate assistant, we kind of just put it on everything right now so it's being utilized. Um, I try to look at uh, other companies actually the Cosmopolitan Magazine, for example, is one that I've seen where they are posting the same um, link. So they're driving content to the same website or the same uh, release, but they're posting it like four or five times in a day with different copy and different images so that they're doing testing. And that's some place that ideally we would want to be so you're not hitting people with the same stuff across every platform. And um, with Twitter specifically because it changes so fast. Someone, you could post it at 11 a.m. and in an hour, nobody, someone's never gonna see it. Uh, and as far as Instagram, that's the one that would be a little bit different where um, the user generated content, we will want to do that more frequently because it's extremely visual. So it's really difficult sometimes for us to share the press release if there's no image associated or one that's really gonna grab the attention, um, as well as the fact that you can't do links um, the same way that you can on Facebook or Twitter. Hi, um, great effort. It's all oriented at generating response. I mean, ultimately that's why you're doing this, right? Mm -hmm. So you're asking for a soft response and then a hard response, a hard sale. Mm -hmm. Are you doing anything to track and communicate with the responders differently once they have responded and either requested a uh, a, a paper or more information, or if they requested a, a visit. And then how is that tracked uh, down the road, uh, ultimately to whether or not that person um, uh, sends it in an application and, and actually registers? Sure, um, so we're actually in the process of making this a lot more robust, the tracking all the way through starting with those, um, the Google custom URLs that will tell us the channel, and then using Google's Tags Manager on the website, which will show up in your analytics to say what they did while they were there, if they completed the goal you want them to. Ideally, if they're filling out um, a form, then we do have their name and email address, and we have communication plans that were, are for, um, if it's an inquiry, if they started their application but they haven't finished, 
and then kind of the next steps after that. So it still continued on. Um, and then from there, because we have the names and the emails, we can check in our application system. Um, so it's a little, that part's a little wonky because it's gonna take a lot more time to check all the names. So we're, I'm trying to think of other ways to make that simpler. Yeah, it's not an easy thing to do. No. When you do transition them, do you, uh, do you transition them out of this kind of communication and <clears throat> into email, direct mail, uh, other media? Uh, yeah, as part of the ongoing uh, nurturing? Yeah, it would um, primarily be email and then using retargeting Facebook ads or on Instagram. So once we have the name and the email as far as uh, inquiry or if they're in progress, we use the ads. You can upload the, um, your email list into Facebook and do specific ads that try to get them to that next step. That wouldn't really work well organically because not everyone's in that step. And then as soon as they um, say move from an inquiry to starting an application, we'll remove the name and put them in the next section. That part again is also, uh, requires a lot of diligence to be updating those uh, lists a lot. So uh, if anyone has a simpler way of doing that, let me know. <laughs> uh, I admire your thoughtful uh, editorial planning, but I just wonder if, if ever um, an event occurs that causes a disruption in that or you need to pivot or there's an opportunity that suddenly springs up? That, it has happened before with um, uh, competing priorities where we've dropped the ball as far as like, okay, we, we had an opening and we needed to put something there and now it's the next day and we missed it. Um, so it does happen and I haven't really, I'm trying to get better at that, hence like trying to like move forward and have that cycle. Um, the other thing is I try to look at our um, calendar or have programs tell me about events so that we can duplicate efforts for like that week. Uh, like we have welcome week coming up when students move in. So during that week, we're gonna follow our uh, plan as well as have extra content about what is going on that week that affects those students. Hi. I don't know if this is on. Um, my name is Derek. I'm an admissions counselor with Pierpont. Um, so you've briefly kind of described like the admissions funnel. Um, how does that look different for a typical undergrad student versus the graduate student? And how do you market that a little bit differently? And kind of what tools have you found to be successful? I unfortunately cannot answer this question fully because we have a completely different undergrad admissions office and they run um, separate from our office. So I only handle graduate admissions um, and I know our, the social media platforms that are admissions based for undergrad are relatively new so um, I'm not sure what they're doing there. I apologize I can't answer this a little bit more. <laughs> This is my last question, I promise. Um, I know I love the conversation about content. I just I think it's really fascinating. It's different, many ways to think about how do we approach content, content um, development and curation. So my question specifically is about um, removing the marketing hat and, and putting on the PR hat for a little while, thinking about um, content development from a PR standpoint. Um, have, has the office ever considered doing 
or um, any thoughts around developing content that not really does a soft sell or hard sell to getting students to come to the program, but more so is contributes to the con conversation about achieving, um, going on to the continuing education space, like going, going out to get up, achieve a higher, a higher degree of master's or PhD program. What are, what are those conversations that we're having online that kind of um, also just, just, just spark the curiosity of somebody who probably wasn't even thinking about going back for that next level degree? helping those uh, older um, population that wants to go back and maybe uh, change their career and how a graduate degree can help them do that. We do um, a lot of blogs where we interview students that um, did one degree in their undergrad and did something else in their master's because they decided like that wasn't for them, there's these new opportunities, and the way to do that was to come back and get this degree, and how those degrees specifically, you don't have to have you know undergraduate background that aligns, um, you can kind of make it to you know what it is you wanting to do. So that's where that content comes into play is in our blog. Um, so we're going to now transition to uh, lunch. We have about 15 minutes uh, break in between now and lunch. So if you have signed up for a resume review or a mock interview, if you could come back around noon, you can bring your lunch with you, um, and then we'll transition you over to those. Thank you, guys. Hmm. I'm just going to get that up.